Namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa Namo tasa pakavato arahato samma samputasa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami <coughs> This is our second day of gathering in memory of Lumpur Cha. And yesterday, for me, it was a very, very beautiful day. I could say it was beautiful in the beginning, and beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. So I'm feeling very grateful for this opportunity. In uh, where Rajan Kuslo and I live, we're on the northern limits of humanity in northern Canada. And it's, it's quite cold, there aren't that many people there. So to be here with so many people of good faith, people of good heart, who love the Dhamma, who are so generous, it's a, it's a, it's a great privilege indeed. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I thought I'd just make some historical comment about this interesting painting of Lung Po Cha. You'll find that painting in many of the publications that have been um, given so freely and generously. And in that vein, I'd like to thank all the people who have worked on these publications, the uh, compilers, the editors, the people who distributed the books, the sponsors, and so on. We received uh, a significant number of these books in our monastery, and I've had the good fortune of distributing them at retreats and uh, various Buddhist meetings and people in Canada are, are profoundly grateful for the generosity they're receiving from here. So we are connected in this rather grand and beautiful way. And so gratitude is, is a very fitting theme for our weekend here. Back to this portrait. <clears throat> it looks like a photo. It's actually a, a pastel portrait. And I think in the back cover, it's mentioned that the artist is Jerry Rollison. Jerry was when um, Lompo Sumato and I and Ajahn Shichito were in the Hampstead of Vihara in London. Jerry was our first Anagarika, our first Kapiya, prototype Kapiya. And Jerry was, uh, as well as being a, a a meditator and a good-hearted man. He was also a very, very skilled artist. When Ajahn Chah came to visit the Hampstead Buddhist Vihara in London, Jerry took 10 pictures of Ajahn Chah and he, he showed me the 10 pictures and he just clicked, click, 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 just 10 pictures. And he just showed me Ajahn, how Ajahn Chah's face would change over those 10 pictures and it's like he just went very empty. But also, being an artist, he, he cut, he put one half, he blanked out one half of the picture, showed me on one half of his face looks this way, one half of the face looks that way. It was interesting how an artist perceives or sees you know, in, in, the, in the photo. So he took that photo, and then in the next two years, between 1977 and 79, he he, I think it's honest to say, he was obsessed with this painting. He worked very, very diligently. And the impressive thing about his work that he really didn't do portraiture. His, his favorite medium was glass. <clears throat> very skilled man. So, when Ajahn Chah was there in 77, um, just the, the way Ajahn Chah related to Jerry was very heartwarming. Now, now Jerry, uh, like our tradition, we don't smoke cigarettes, but Jerry was a, a heavy smoker, so he'd slip off into the garden to get some cigarettes. And he tried to quit, but he became so erratic that it was decided he better not quit smoking. <laughs> Life would be too difficult for all of us. So, so Jerry he continued to smoke his cigarettes and somewhere in the background and so on. Now, so Ajahn Chah arrived 
And Ajahn Chah had, had a way of being tremendously compassionate to the most, the people who, who you know, had complex problems like Westerners, <laughs> who were slightly neurotic maybe. And he had this tremendous way of drawing people in <clears throat> and relaxing them and making them uh, feel loving about themselves, I suppose. So one day, uh, we look out into the, into the garden of the Hampstead Vihara, and there's Lompo Cha smoking a cigarette with Jerry. <laughs> now, I'd, I'd heard that Lompo Cha had smoked as a young man, or maybe a young monk, but he, had, he forbade smoking in his monastery, so I'd never seen this. But what was so very beautiful about it was, first of all, Ajahn Chah was a very elegant smoker. <laughs> A tremendous grace, very sort of regal. But what was more significant was how happy Jerry was. Here he was sitting with a master, rolling a cigarette for the master, <laughs> and enjoying the cigarette. So from that loving gesture, and it was a very loving gesture, uh, Jerry became very close to Ajahn Chah, and so he determined to try to do a portrait of Ajahn Chah. So he took those ten pictures and then worked incredibly hard trying to get it perfect. And it does, you know, if you look at that, it does look like a, a, a photo to me. The, the original picture hangs in Chithurst in Ajahn Sichito's monastery. Uh, and it's, it's really a beautiful piece of work. So, over these two years, Jerry finally finished the painting, and he lived on the third floor of the Hampstead Vihara, which was in, on a busy street in London. And he, he finished and he invited us up to his room before Ajahn Chah came, and we were, we, were, we were just amazed at how wonderful this thing was, and it was a really beautiful piece of work, and we were just loading him with praise, and he was loving it. <clears throat> but we were very curious to see how Ajahn Chah would react. Huh? So Ajahn Chah then arrived, 1979, Jerry cleaned his room up, all nice and clean, first time in two years, I think. <laughs> and he invited Ajahn Chah up into his studio come room. And we're all watching Ajahn Chah, you know, if your teacher comes, you're sort of, what's he going to do with this? So, and Lung Paul Cha goes up to the painting, he starts to look at it. Jerry's looking at him, we're looking at him. And he, I was asking Ajahn Suchito if I have the memory right, because memory is a funny thing, and I think I have it right. So he then turned to, to the crayons, because this is a pastel work. He turned to the crayons and he took a piece of charcoal. And he turned to Jerry and said, Jerry, would you be upset if I scribbled all over this? <laughs> and Jerry said, maybe. <laughs> so Ajahn Chah had this way of, <clears throat> I, th I think I'm correct to say he had a way of really drawing you in with his deep compassion and then poking you a bit. Because he would, he would create this trusting relationship that you know this man cares for you. And even if, even, even if the attention he gave you was somewhat um, difficult for your ego, maybe, it was attention you, you were grateful for because it was something that was felt to be very instructive, very caring. So, so, so there is these two sides, that many sides of this teacher which I experienced, um, which have influenced me for all my life, really. Um, meeting a, a person like this, it, it just, you, you have this feeling, I want to be like him. Whatever he has, I want. Not in a way of greed, but in the way of practice. And he would not, he would not allow people to become um, attached to his charisma as a, some kind of a guru. He'd always just point back to you. Where's your problem? Where's the suffering? You have to work on your suffering. So that's the, so next time you look at the picture, you'll have a bit of story around that picture. 
<clears throat> I'd like to perhaps just talk about my own, my own struggles with fear and how I've dealt with that and to kind of just indicate that to understand the Dhamma it cannot just be an intellectual uh, position. You can study Buddhism, you can study the Four Noble Truths, but when your heart suffers, you're challenged to see, do I really understand the Dhamma? Do I really have a path which liberates the heart? Or am I just, <clears throat> uh, am I just limited to an intellectual understanding? Intellect is important, obviously. It gives us a tool for investigation. But quite often, the real insights of our, of our life come from struggle. It's just the, way, the nature of things, isn't it? So my own, one of the strongest struggles I've experienced is around fear. And oddly enough, it's, it was, uh, I, I was a very shy kid. I was so shy that I'd be afraid to answer a telephone. I'd run away. Um, I had some courage to try things out, but around people I was a very, very shy person. So when I became a bhikkhu, I thought, well, I could just be in the background the rest of my life and life would be nice and easy. And then all of a sudden, I was asked to come to England and I found myself in teaching positions. And the whole prelude to any talk for me the whole day before I'd have to teach anything was filled with anxiety and fear in a, in a most awful kind of way. So intellectually I could understand, let go, don't make it a problem, everyone likes you, it's just a Dhamma talk. But emotionally, emotionally the, the, the strength of the fear was, was almost overpowering at times. And so I would try to do something about it. I would try to do some kind of a practice. I would try to plan my talks. Uh, I, would, um, I would just try to repress it and get rid of it. I'd try to analyze myself, but nothing worked. My heart would get triggered in fear, and I would feel this incredible fear. And my teacher would keep saying, well, you have to use the Four Noble Truths. You have to use the, the, the structure of this teaching. There is suffering, there's a struggle, there's a cause, there's an end to suffering, and there's a path. And although I could understand that intellectually, it was hard for me to understand. So, yeah, I'd want to get rid of this fear. The fear is the problem. And for a long time, I didn't see that the fear was not the problem. The fear was just old karma, something coming up into consciousness, from who knows where, maybe because I was a refugee, I'm not sure, but it didn't really matter. The real problem was the aversion to the fear and the desire not to have the fear. That was the problem. And that took me so long to figure out, so long to figure out, because I just tried to get rid of the fear. But what was interesting about having to give Dharma talks was that I had to do it again and again and again and again. I knew if I'm going to be a bhikkhu, I better figure this out. I'm not going to be free until I figure it out. So the whole pattern of having to give Dhamma talks became my best friend. And it's a cliche in Dhamma that your, your, your biggest enemy is your best friend. Because the thing that obsesses my, my, your mind the most, be it anger or fear or um, lust or whatever, the thing that obsesses your mind the most is the thing that if it is understood will give you the greatest freedom. It's obvious, isn't it? So if my mind has a strong karmic tendency towards fear, then I have to understand fear. I have to be with it. I have to look at it and really understand it in a very, very clear way. And so giving these Dhamma talks then began to be a way of trying to understand the Four Noble Truths within the karma of fear. So I'd have to give the Dhamma talk, the fear would come up, and I'd start thinking, planning a talk, planning a talk. And what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Then I'd try to give the talk, my mind would go blank. Anyone who gives talks knows this kind of pattern. And then finally I began to say, well, what's the cause of suffering here? Is it the fear, or is it the desire 
not to have this feeling of fear. And that's easy to say, but it took me a long time. But when I began to see that, I said, it's, it's I don't want this fear. I want to get rid of this fear. I began to be aware of fear. So although I knew I was afraid, I wasn't really aware of fear. I was looking at fear in order to get rid of fear. And I began to see, that's, that's not, that doesn't work. What works is awareness. So what is awareness? Awareness is this is the way it is now. And then Ajahn Sumedho began to give me very good teaching. He says, Vir Dhammo, you have to welcome the fear. And I said, that doesn't make sense. If I welcome the fear, it'll get worse. He says, no, no, no. The problem's not the fear. It's the desire not to have the fear. And so I began to see that metta practice, the practice of loving kindness, the practice of goodwill, was actually much deeper than simply a technique for wishing you well, wishing myself well. It really was the basis of mindfulness around the fear. Because if I did not have metta for the fear, I wouldn't let it into my heart, and I wasn't really aware. So I began to bring into consciousness ideas like welcoming, stay here, it's okay, not a problem. But this was very difficult because I had to give the Dhamma talk. Fear was, fear was always challenging me. And then I began to see that fear isn't just a mental thing, it's a very physical thing. And I began to appreciate mindfulness of the body. Because when we feel fear or when we feel anger, these deep-rooted things, not only do we have narratives and stories, what am I going to say, and they won't like me, and oh, it was a terrible talk, and those are all the stories and narratives and thinking, papancha, around these emotions like fear. That exists, but deeper than that, the body. The body feels these things, and, and deeply and profoundly. And I began to realize that if I could combine metta practice, welcoming, 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 and body awareness, I could begin to investigate fear in a much more profound way than always being caught up in the thinking. So the practice began to deepen in a way which not, wasn't based upon some exalted form of samadhi, it was based upon my own predicament, my own existential problem of fear and the resolution of fear. And if our practice doesn't address those things, if our practice is somehow abstract, then we'll never be free. And, and, and we're all, we all want to be free. So addressing this particular predicament I was in um, was difficult, but it's proved to be very, very fruitful. So then I began to see that fear comes up, how does it feel? In, in the stomach, pit of the stomach, in the heart, in the chest, in the shoulders, in the head. I began to see I began to be, be a witness of fear rather than be the fearful person. I began to be aware of fear rather than caught up in fear as an object. The witness of fear rather than being fearful. And this is a big step in the meditative practice. And we call it Sakaya Ditti, the end of Sakaya Ditti, when we no longer uh, are caught in the personal stories and narratives, but we see this is just a condition. This is one of the khandhas. This is an emotion. It has power. It's unpleasant, but it feels this way. And so the practice of metta and body awareness began to allow this fear to be fully conscious. And as it began to be fully conscious, it became less intrusive. Uh, it became less powerful. And the mindfulness and awareness and metta and body awareness became more and more powerful. And those factors were more... Um, dominant rather than the fear. Now, this took me a long time. Uh, a lot of meditation retreats, uh, a lot of Dhamma talks. And, and the beauty of that was repetition. There's something about repeated suffering. If it doesn't totally oppress you, repeatedly being in some kind of human relationship or uh, a human situation where the same pattern of suffering comes up into your heart, it's brilliant because you can see it again and again and again. If I get a, a, a fear which is just a one-off, a dog barks at me and I jump, I can't really work with that. But if I have a situation where I'm always getting irritated at someone at work, or I'm always frightened about something, or I'm always self-critical about some aspect of myself, and it comes up again and again and again, that is very fruitful for practice because I can 
I can begin to say, what, what's, what's the suffering here? What's going on? Why does the suffering arise? And in that slow coming to consciousness, that slow awakening to this, insight arises. And the thing about insight is I, you don't really program insight. Insight comes by allowing yourself to be fully conscious to your predicament, to your problem, to your struggle. And it's a very, it's a, in, in a sense, it's a very much an opening of the heart to the way things are. Now, insight, when it really works, it begins to free you. And then insight, which frees you, leads to what? It leads to gratitude. What is the thing that I am most grateful for in this human birth? It's for the Dhamma. Without the Dhamma, my life would be so shallow. And so who am I most grateful to? My teachers, the Buddha, my parents, Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Sumedho, Ajahn Sajid, so many monks, I, and, and lay teachers too, many teachers. So, so the beauty of insight is that you face your own suffering, you're honest and, 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 and take responsibility for your own suffering, and, and you look at it in a way not just analytically, not just intellectually, you look at it with your heart, you feel it with your heart. And from that openness, insight arises, from insight there is gratitude, and from gratitude there is what? There's action. Like all, all the senior monks that I know, they want to serve, they want to help, they want to teach, because what else would you want to do? You want to give back, because it's such a beautiful gift. And so the opening of the heart is also the motivation for right action. My own experience with, with, um, with, with fear um, was quite often, was sometimes I'd think, well, I'm through this now. This isn't going to happen again. And I could maybe give a Dhamma talk and I wouldn't be nervous. And then Ajahn Chah's constant reminder, it's uncertain. This is uncertain would come up. And there was one time when my, my dad had died. He died in 1987 and I had taken care of him. He had cancer. So taking care of him for a few months and I was with him. And, and I went back to uh, New Zealand and I had, a, I had been scheduled to give a short talk at an ecumenical meeting in the cathedral in, in Auckland. And I, I, I wasn't giving the keynote address, I was only giving a little five minute address for the Buddhist section of this gathering. And I was very much um, taken with my dad's dying and, and, and uh, very sincere in what I had experienced and, and so the little talk I gave was well received. So the organizers of this <clears throat> of this gathering then asked me, would you like to give the keynote address the following year? And I felt confident. I said, sure. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> so, comes the day, a year later, same cathedral, 400 people, ecumenical, Buddhist, Christian, Judaic, uh, Islamic, many traditions. I have to give the keynote address. What happens? I get a panic attack. I said, not now. It's the most awful feeling. And, it, you know, what? It just like came out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere. All of a sudden, the factors and conditions were there. And the sense of fear arose so strongly, I was afraid to walk onto the stage. But I had no choice. <laughs> so I, you know, walked on the stage. I trembled. And then and I gave this talk. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes... If, I'm, if I've had fear, then I speak, I, to kind of overcome the fear, I speak in a really powerful way, so I sound angry. <laughs> so I'm giving, okay, so here's the, I'm giving a talk to an ecumenical peace gathering, and I sound like I'm, I'm angry. <laughs> Very embarrassing. So, well, I, I finished the talk, and then I was going back to, uh, I was staying with a Tibetan monk, Lama Samtan, and Lama something, and he was Tibetan monk, and in his very, very kind of gentle Asian way, not being direct, you know, not saying things directly, says to me, you know, Buddhism's about peace. <laughs> oh. But I thought, yeah, maybe it didn't sound good, but I did it. 
You know, I, I took the, I got on the stage, I struggled through with it, and then I tried to remain mindful with it. I must admit, I felt very embarrassed. And as I felt embarrassed, my mind, where did it want to go? It wanted to go to self-disparagement. You dummy, you're a dummo, you know, you practiced all these years and you still know how to give a dumb talk, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, no, go to the body, go to metta. This is what it feels like to feel like an idiot. <laughs> this is embarrassment. Embarrassment feels this way. And I'd go to the body again, same practice. I'd go to the body and I'd welcome it. I'd welcome this feeling of embarrassment and, and uh, whatever. And then it would pass. And once we, I think once we understand, I mean, this is my understanding with my particular formations and so on, and that, that struggle that we have in our own practice takes a lot of honesty, uh, a lot of persistence, a lot of courage. But if we stay with it, then I think those insights that we get about something which is very powerful and profound, those insights then begin to be the insights we use for all of our suffering because they are profound insights. They're not shallow. And we begin to understand the words in the books much more profoundly. The words begin to fit our experiences. Oh, that's what letting go is about. That's what non-attachment is about. That's what awareness is about. So it's no longer an abstract. It's concrete. It's about my existence. And, and from that repeated application of insight, a repeated application of what we call practice, there is more and more understanding, there's more and more freedom, and there's more and more gratitude. And as there's more gratitude, there's more energy. More energy to serve, more energy to love and care for people. It's, and it's a very natural kind of opening of the heart, opening of the cycle. Now the last time I had one of these sort of fearful attacks was I think around the early 90s and I had just I had just um, I just finished teaching a 10-day retreat in in Toronto or near Toronto and my mother and brother and his family living in Ottawa which is about a five-hour drive and I'd finished the retreat I was staying with someone and I got a telephone call from someone that my brother and my mother were in a car train accident a train had hit their car. I got no other information. I didn't know if they were, they, they were in hospital. And my mind went crazy with panic. It just lost it. It was so afraid. And I couldn't, I couldn't get there till the next morning. And again, this, this powerful, visceral fear came into consciousness. But, you know, as we say, the practice clicked in. And if I could just follow on um, Ajahn Siripanyo's talk about uh, walking meditation. Yesterday he was talking about walking meditation. Just to expand on that, one of the things he mentioned, uh, didn't maybe expand on, was the speed of walking. Now, what I found as a young monk, if I had strong emotional energy, which I had to deal with, I was angry or whatever, I would just walk up and down, just walk up and down, just burn the energy off because it was so powerful and sitting was just too difficult so that I was I was staying in somewhere where there was quite a long uh, basement we have basements in Canada um, and this this fearful energy came up and I knew I could do nothing about it and I just did walking meditation back and forth back and my mind tried to you know think I said you can't figure this one out Viridamo you just have to go there Back, back and forth, back and, and I had to walk for I think a whole hour before that primal fear about my family finally subsided. But it was the same practice. It was welcoming body awareness. Simple, but the experience was, was, was inexplicably difficult. To finish the story, I went up and, and my brother uh, only had minor scrapes and what my brother had done he had been working very, very, very hard um, and doing a lot of all-nighters and he was taking mom to his place and there was a train crossing and the train crossing didn't have the, the barriers. It only had the bells, the flashing bells in Ottawa and he hadn't seen them and he went across the train tracks and the train hit the car. 
Fortunately, the train was going very slow and it glanced the car, it pushed the car about 30 meters. He was okay. Mum had a broken shoulder. But at least they were alive and at least they were able to recover from all that. But, you know, life is like that, isn't it? You know, we are, we are faced with profound shocks. But often it's not. Often life is very mundane, very ordinary. And it's in the ordinary, I think, in the, in the just the mundane irritations of life or, the, or, the, or, or just the times when nothing great is happening, that we develop a foundation of mindfulness which then is, 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 is it, it, like we say, it clicks in, doesn't it? Like if I've done some kind of meditation practice, if I've done body meditation, if I know what metta means beyond a formula of may I be well and may you be well, if I understand metta is the true opening of the heart to all things, if I've really delved into that practice, that done it again and again and again, then when something difficult happens and we, we face grief or loss, then we have the equipment to be with that as Dhamma. We, it, these aren't great feelings, they're not happy feelings, but they are important because as we as we are able to endure even the seemingly unendurable, our confidence in awareness, in body awareness, in metta, becomes even more profound. The insights become even more profound. They're the same insights. It's the same sense of confidence that we get. And from all of that, again, there is gratitude. And from the gratitude, we are even more empowered to act in the world in good and wholesome ways. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, beautiful thing to do to, to use this life both for social good, both for responsible living, for uh, caring for our loved ones, for caring for our environment, taking care of the trees and the water and the soil. These are beautiful things to do but also to, to use this life as a kind of laboratory of understanding, uh, a place where the challenges of life are not just arbitrary. They're not just things that come out at you because of bad karma, but they're the places where if you work with them, insight arises. And, and, and so going back to that idea that the most profound uh, difficulty you have, if you can look at it, if you can be with it, then it becomes the place of profound insight. It's a simple equation, difficult to do. So if I could maybe just then touch on metta and, and, and body awareness. Um, when I first came across metta bhavana in the texts, it, was, it seemed very formulaic to me. So there'd be a formula which uh, I would go through and I'd say, may my mom be well, and may my dad be well, and my teachers be well, may I be well, may the monk I don't like, may he be well, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So that, was, that, had, that had a good effect. <clears throat> um, but it was, it was very much sort of dualistic, me and you and so on. And then uh, one day I was... I was um, I was going through some difficulty in, in my own practice, some, um, I can't remember quite what it was, but, but suddenly I felt, I felt my heart kind of crack. I felt something going on here. And I think before that time, my, uh, my approach was, was very much in intellect. And so I, I, would, I would read things and I'd memorize lists and, and they were helpful. They were helpful ways of focusing the mind. But then suddenly I, I realized that my attention rests a lot with thinking. It likes to just hang out in thinking. And that my attention didn't rest with the body much. And it didn't rest with the heart. And so it was a kind of um, calling, I suppose. Something called to me just and that's how insight works sometimes. You, don't, you can't quantify it and you can't predict it, but something speaks to you and you say, ah, that's, there's something there. There's something interesting. There's something about this which I need to 
understand. And so I began to um, contemplate more metta practice as a, uh, as a continual uh, welcoming and opening to life situations. And I began to do um, body awareness in the heart center. And I would just learn to take my attention away from the thinking mind and just let it rest here with no formula, but just let it rest here, just let it rest here, just let it rest here. And what I found with body meditation is that because I hadn't really paid attention to the body that much, only when it was experiencing some kind of extreme pain or pleasure, I wasn't really conscious of the body. You know, I hadn't really given it the attention. If I stepped on a nail or whatever, then I knew the body was there. But otherwise, it was like from here down, there was no consciousness. The consciousness wasn't aware of that. And so that took a, it, 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 it required a kind of deliberate training to go from thought down to the body. Go from thought down to the body. And I got better and better at it because this is the practice. If you don't force things, and you allow your attention to dwell in other areas, you become conscious of those areas, don't you? Yeah, that's just the nature of it. And, and I remember when we were building the Harnam Monastery, we were doing the roofing. And uh, I'd never done roofing, but <laughs> this is the nature. We, didn't, you know, we had to do the roofing, so I got, learned how to do roofing, and I was doing roofing, and I was obsessed with roofing. So when I went to give a talk in Newcastle, all I saw was roofing. That's the way the mind works, isn't it? So if I start to pay attention to the body deliberately, then I'll notice the body. It's just the way it is. So as I began to pay attention to this area, I began to see and feel and feel uh, the difference between aversion and fear and compassion and joy. I began to see it. And it wasn't just a narrative in my mind. It was a very visceral experience of, 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 of consciousness, how it operated both as an energetic form, as a bodily form, and a mental form. And that was very helpful because I began to know myself not just through the intellectual, critical, judgmental, analytical way. I was very, you know, I could do that a lot. How well I did it, I don't know. So I could be very judgmental about myself or I could analyze all kinds of things. It shouldn't be like this and this is because of that and so on. But to just to know myself in a bodily way, to know anger or, or fear or, or greed in a bodily way and just to learn to rest with it was very instructive because it began to show me this is just a force in nature. Nature arises now. These conditions create this feeling. And the capacity to witness became stronger. The capacity to know these khandhas, these formations, in a witnessing way. And I began to see that that witnessing, that awareness, is more profound, is more peaceful, is a source of, of peace in my life. And so then I began to do practices to enhance the areas of the heart which were fruitful. So, for instance, um, when I was taking care of my mother, um, I, would, uh, I would go to our monastery on the, on the weekends, get some rest, and then be with her during the weekdays. And my mother loved flowers. She just loved flowers. And I loved seeing my mom happy. How can you help it? So what I would do is on the way back, our driver would go to the market, and he would get some cut flowers or a pot of flowers. And then I, you know, I'd take them to her and I'd wash her face. And I'd see the incredible, sincere joy. And she was in her 90s, so there, the, her senses weren't giving her much fun. Her body hurt, her hearing didn't work, and so on. But just to see her happiness, uh, if I gave her 12 tulips or 12 daffodils, it was such a beautiful thing to behold to see her happy. And that's mudita. And then I, you know, because I was practicing body awareness, not only was there this particular lovely experience with my mom, there was also the realization, ah, mudita feels in here. 
this feels, this feels very, very wholesome. This feels very skillful. And then I would take that skillful feeling of the heart and then I would use it in my meditation. Why not? There it is. So I'd use memory, but memory now skillful. Not just, not just kind of cognitive memory or narrative memory, but I use n memory as feeling because we are memory beings. We can remember things, but we can remember them emotionally, feeling-wise. If I remember someone who harmed me, I can feel resentment in the heart. So I'd, I'd use, in a positive way, I'd use that to begin my meditation. So I'd sit down and I'd just visualize mom's happiness. And it was a very easy way to come to the heart. And I began to enliven the heart, as it were, through this kind of meditation. But now it was no longer an intellectual formulation. And it wasn't just me thinking a formula. It was like really getting to the heart, literally the heart of the practice of, of mudita and all the Brahma Viharas. And so I'd, I'd, um, I'd be with that and I'd stimulate that. And so the heart became more and more alive in that way. And the, and the corollary to that was when the heart closed, and, and, and still to this day, when the, if the heart closes, then it becomes very apparent. This is aversion. Uh, this is fear. And it's a quick, a quick knowing. It's not the mind spinning off and right away something's going on here. Pay attention. Your heart's closing. Pay attention. And, and, and it, 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 become, it continues to be a very lovely place to practice awareness in the heart. When my mother died, it was interesting to see, what are you going to do with your heart now? There's no longer the smile. You know, there's no longer the flowers. Um, there's, first of all, the dying process is very painful to watch, someone you love. And then the heart doesn't want to look at that. It's too much, it's too painful. But I said, no, stay with the heart. Stay here. So, I mean, I had to be here in, in terms of thinking about medical solutions and so on and so forth, but just to stay here, stay with the heart. And I could see that even though that was painful to watch, just the kind of constant Buddhist reflection that with birth there is death, and, and experiencing that, again, not as an intellectual formulation, but as something in the heart, then her passing brought me to a profound peace because I stayed with the heart. So the heart stayed open to something very, very difficult, to the loss of someone I, I love deeply, that I was very close to. And that, and that profound piece of upeka, um, we hear about equanimity, the fourth of the Brahma Viharas, and I often thought, well, how do you get to equanimity? You know, I'm not equanimous. I still get upset. Da, 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 da. Well, it seems to me the way you get to equanimity is by having goodwill towards non-equanimity. If I feel non-equanimity, if I feel anger, or I feel upset about something, or whatever, if I open my heart to the feeling of, oh, I'm re I really hate that person. <laughs> I really don't like them. And I go to that feeling, or some feeling of self-disparagement, and I open to that, then that's the beginning of acceptance. The acceptance comes from the open heart. The open heart leads to what we call purification. Because when we open our hearts to these difficult struggles that we have as human beings, that, that very opening of the heart creates a kind of process of purification. These things which we call asavas or anusayas or kilesa, latent tendencies, they come up into consciousness. But because we don't reinforce them, we don't make them real, we witness to them. They, they go out, they go out, they go out, and after a while their energy ceases. It dies away and we are freed of them. And then there's a deeper opeka, there's a deeper equanimity. Not because we've willfully gotten rid of anything, but we've had the courage to sustain an open heart to something which is difficult to be open-hearted to. Difficult things, but, but, but truly, truly, I think truly this is a noble quest in that way. You know, what is more noble than being honest about your own predicament, taking it on board, learning from it, and then, and then having the opportunity to share it. And, and, and be a person who comes from that kind of place of the open heart. So I think that's sufficient for me today. I, 
Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for your kindness and generosity. As I was saying yesterday, uh, this was my uh, first visit to Malaysia. And one of the things Ajahn Chah was very, very good at, he said when, when, a, when a Western disciple's uh, parents would come, he'd be very, very um, charismatic. He'd bring them in and take, take good care of them. And then during their stay, they might have troubles with the food or the mosquitoes. They might find it difficult. And then at the very end, he would be really, really kind and charismatic. So their memory of the monastery was very, very beautiful. So I've come to Malaysia. I've come to this beautiful gathering. This is my first impression, and it is truly a wonderful impression. And I'm sure I'll leave in the, in the same way, and I hope to be back. Thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.